a generation, as a generation that started listening to you and to Genesis and to prog rock, yeah. I put and I admire and, and appreciate yeah. it a yeah. lot. But it's not something that I connect to. What is it no, about the blues? I tell you what it is. I tell you what it is that affected my generation. It's because that was the genre where sonic developments started to happen. Right. G- guitars started to distort. They started to use echo. Right. Um, so it was within the simple framework of blues that rock, as we know it, was born. The more sophisticated kinds uh, followed. But without blues, you wouldn't have had that. Mm. Guitars would still be sounding very much like the shadows. Right. Nothing wrong with the shadows, mind you. I bought lots of shadows records. Yeah. But the idea of something as a percussion instrument rather than something that sounds closer to the human voice or the violin or the trumpet or or any other thing. But... Um, and then you've got harmonica, which is a very expressive little instrument, which can virtually talk in the right hands and cry and wah and all of that sort of stuff. So I, I think we're probably trying to emulate the human voice with all of this kind of stuff. Right. right? And the blues was a kind of a, a blueprint, an illustration, um, the template for uh, much of what was to follow sonically. Um, Jeff Beck always sounded like he was a very melodic player working in blues early on yeah. and doing phrases that were not... Um, that hadn't come from from uh, the, the States. I mean, obviously he had all of that, but then there was all this um, this other sort of stuff, you know, with thirds being used. Right. And uh, they weren't so common in blues. <laughs> similar sort of cohesiveness to the effects as there is to Voyage of the Acolyte, which I think is an extraordinary album. Um, and I wanted to talk about, we were talking about obviously alluding to bits of Genesis. Um, is there a sense that Genesis was in some way, maybe it sounds like an obvious question, an apprenticeship? Not, I don't mean in yeah. terms of, did you view it that, that consciously as that? Um, I think... When I look back, um, it was that, and a sorcerer's apprentice, yes, absolutely, um, uh, there was a lot to learn. I remember having a conversation with Phil, or rather one of those rhetorical conversations where I shut up, <laughs> and it was, he said, um, we're bound to influence each other. I'd never worked with a group, really, and not certainly not a group of thinkers. Yeah. Um, not properly, they right. going away, doing gigs, and... <clears throat> and um, influencing each other and that was that was very interesting to yeah. me that I hadn't really worked with others and the idea of writing something with other people it was it was completely foreign alien to me I'd either written stuff on my own or on my own <laughs> there were no collaborators so um, uh, that that was hard to uh, assimilate you know how was how was that going to work and um but there were moments when it happened spontaneously, and um, like the end of Fountain of Sal Marcus, yeah. for instance. Just where, sorry, yeah. But we were actually living together in right. in, uh, in one place, so it was as communal as it gets. Okay. And um, um, it actually served the music very well. Right. Um, I think, you know, along the line, it didn't really serve everybody when everyone started to have kids. Oh. And, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. It all goes you know, over. Yeah. You know, cottages have got their. The limitations when uh, the babies are crying. Those, when the babies are crying, yeah, you've got all those. Got did you? All those did things. they? Did they? Did you feel they kept you in a box then, to some extent, slightly? Genesis kept me in a box. Oh, well, I think they. Yes, I think they. They kept me um, very tight leash. I did feel very controlled. Um, I didn't realise you were supposed to fight. I didn't realise that. I wasn't really combative. Mm. Uh, but then again, as I say, you know, naively, um, I'd always really had my own way. So. Yeah. <laughs> Almost like an only child, whereas Genesis, as a group in the main, you know, had had... They'd known each other since they were 11 years old, course, lock, yeah. locked up together. No women. <laughs> and, always... and, um, and Phil, of course, yes. had come from stage. and uh, Dan the, Rowe, the, acting, the, yeah. These guys were much more integrated. Yeah. I was... Um, I was a lone wolf. I was the only um, Jew in my year at school, so yeah. you were the only Jew in that year. Yeah, I was. <laughs> I think that's it. So, 
Um, and um, you've always been very diplomatic. Nothing wrong with being Jewish. No, not at all. Uh, we were well, we were well balanced people. We've got my, a chip on each shoulder. That's right. And <laughs> and, um, and of course, you know, there's plenty of drive from the from the Jewish side, which uh, yeah. is on my mother's side of the family. Right. Um, yeah, I think, and 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 Joe, my my wife, um, one side of her family, her father's side, you know, where they were violinists, her father and yeah. and grandfather, both violinists. Um, working in the East End, my right. grandfather oh, the Yiddish taught, or... taught all day, right. and then in the evening he would have students that he would take on, I believe, for nothing, and work till 11 o'clock at night, every day of his life, have dinner at, at 11.30, fall over, and do it all over again. I, I don't think he ever really slept and had a, yeah. a life outside that. Yeah. And, um, uh, that seems to me to be extraordinarily hard working and uh, I hope I get to meet him one day in spirit and shake his hand and say I thought I worked hard but you you know there's a great Lenny Bruce routine about certain things being Jewish and certain things being not and that you can say pavements are Jewish and uh, but you say cabbages aren't and you can certainly say I think think maybe guitarists and string players are Jewish but not not keyboard players maybe Perhaps yes, yes. Keyboard players couldn't afford the uh, <laughs> couldn't afford the piano, but the spoons. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've so I come been... from a long line of harmonica players too. Right, right. You've always been really diplomatic about Genesis politics. Yes. And certain members of the band. Right. Um, is it? Are you veil? Are you disguising uh, a deeper hurt without wanting to go into it, and without wanting to talk about things you don't want to talk about? Maybe. Um, I think I think we were uh, we were raised differently. I I I think that they were trained uh, to lead a charge in the Crimea and not flinch under fire. I suspect that each member of Genesis would be capable in a in a different era of doing that. Um, What I'm saying is, I think there was a level of determination there. So therefore, there is respect that comes from me. But at the same time, I think it could have been done without quite so many casualties and the ultimate casualty is the band itself isn't Absolutely. it at the end of the day there is no band so um how constructive <laughs> is is that you know it, people do play themselves into a corner and I'll take that with me and then there's, there's a fabulous no one's going to play with yeah them. absolutely there's a fabulous one of Sean play called the designated mourner so don't which uh, Mike Nichols was in at, at the national a few years ago and it was it's about based on this idea in African societies when yeah. um, a tribe dies or passes out, or passes into extinction, there's always yeah. one designated mourner who's there to tell, talk about the tribe that's gone. Yes, to tell so the tale. there's a sense that you, know, you perhaps remind them, what you were saying yes. earlier about Mike Rosford's yeah. comment, that you perhaps you remind them of what an opportunity sort of missed, in a sense, or a... Because as yeah. Stephen Wilson says in yes. the DVD, nobody yes. really talks about the 80s music anymore. They only talk about, obviously, the Gabriel um, yeah. era. That's right. And after yeah. that, the later yeah. period. But yes. yeah, you have, without wishing to sit in your house and sort of flatter you unduly, you are, I think, responsible. Oh, flatter to... away. I will, okay, then I'll do that. <laughs> I've drunk in your coffee, Steve. So, well. so the, the, I think you're responsible for two of the most beautiful Genesis songs, which are, um, or co write in Entangled, and of, of course, Blood on the Rooftops. Right. Which are yeah. two of the greatest songs in the Genesis canon, uh... in my view. I think things come out of desperation. Um, I think, you know, when I did Voyager the Acolyte, it was just before the band was con- to convene and yeah. I'd given birth to that and suddenly it was like, oh, got to give birth twice now, I've got to have another baby. And um, uh, I, I had maybe three or four ideas and one of them was entangled. Yeah. Um, and um, Phil liked the idea. I think that's the reason why that, yeah. why that happened. Uh, he said, "Oh, this got a, this has got a more uh, a Mary Poppins feel to it, you know, over the rooftops and houses." And um, so, yes, that got done. The other thing, blood on the rooftops. Again, I think it, it's two separate things. You've got the great long introduction to it on guitar um, with that amazing you know, chord in it. I forgive me, I don't know my, my ignorance. The chord. Oh, is it a stretch? The, yeah, the, the, the one, massive the, stretch the, in the, it. The, the V. The stretch. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, stunning. The answer to Rat Maninoff and fret, <laughs> fretboard turns and, and list with the big, you know, uh, thing there. And 
Yeah, so th I guess that's difficult for people to do. I've only got short fingers, but they must be flexible enough to, to do that. Um, I thought, well, I don't know if I'll get away with it, but I'd like to do a long introduction to, mm. to lead people into the song. Yeah. Um, and then the song was um, as informed by the changes that I'd find in um, uh, Jimmy Webb, yeah. who was in turn influenced by... Um, Vaughan Williams mm. so he liked church music I think he grew up I think his father may have been a minister we grew oh. up in church learning uh, this stuff and then trying to stretch the harmonies as, as far as possible and I, I think he's possibly our greatest still living songwriter Jimmy Webb right. so I am a huge fan okay. um, as were the rest of Genesis four out of five of us chose without conferring when we were asked whether our favourite single um, four out of five of us chose uh, MacArthur Park, the uh, Richard Harris version. Yeah, so you left your cake out in the room. That's right, yeah. And, uh, you know, it starts beginning to sound a lot like Genesis, doesn't it? Seven mm. minute song, yeah. instrumental workout in, in the middle. Um, you've got the verses and chorus, but then you've also got this other verse that's, uh, and it's storytelling and, and um, it's nostalgic and hugely romantic. And you've got harpsichord, you've got piano, you've got. Um, a, a huge orchestra, yeah. and you've got an actor, yeah. and it shouldn't singing. Work, uh, it shouldn't it really work, yeah. And I think you know Peter Gabriel. I think the early stuff that he did, it was approached like an actor, and a lot of it was declaiming, and mm. and then um, a little bit later he was dressing up as a part, embodying yeah. the thing, much the same as 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 Bowie yeah, in a way, absolutely, and perhaps even before Bowie, yeah. Um, but in a way, it doesn't really matter, does it? You know, who's first and who's who's yeah. afterwards, you know, and who, hell, you know, the candle was passed on. Um, the fact is, they're going to be older brothers in music that you're going to listen to, and they're going to influence you, and then what you do is going to be influenced by them, and you hope no one notices, but often people do, and you say, yes, quite right, yes. I, I borrowed that from this, uh, in the same way that Bach borrowed something from Vivaldi. Right. And, um, so yes, we've all stolen. We're all guilty. Hands up. Hands up. But I think it's 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 about being authentic rather than being original. Um, and okay. uh, original is best, but heartfelt, authentic. Um, yeah, I think that's that's very well, good. Well, I say that a lot in my teaching. There's no real such thing as as originality. Really, there's just really. arrangement. Yes. There's all you've got. Juxtaposition. An amount of notes, a certain amount of ideas, a certain amount of images that you can juggle with. Yes, that's right. I mean, they're, it's the same old notes, as Lennon said, but, you know, I like to think that, you know, infinite worlds are possible within yeah. within that. But it's what's interesting what you were saying about, I, I for me, I, have a, I wrote down just a list of what I thought were the core songs throughout mm -hmm. your, your, your work, but then what you said before about you're no longer interested in just the sort of the one or so song, now it's about the consistent body of albums that form it. So, yeah. in a sense, they all become... Dare I say, a gallery of the Steve yeah. Hackett gallery of works. Nice way of, of looking at it. Funnily enough, um, my my father had passed on a couple of years back now. Oh, uh, we he was a painter, and one of the scenes he liked painting time and time again was the Fairy Glen in Wales at mm. Betsy Coyd. And um, my aunt, who also passed on recently, his sister. My um, wife is my lot she, Yeah, and uh, she had this one. She said, "I know you like this painting, so I want you to have it." And Joe and I both took paintings, one by her father and one by mine, to um, a, a framers recently, because we both felt that neither of the frames were really right for these no. paintings. They didn't valorise the painting, you know, a little bit cheap. And I said, no, 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 it's got to have a great frame. So um, we, we spent ages um, looking at lots and lots of different types of, of frames and then we both agreed that this gold one worked for my dad and, and a white one worked for for her dad and um, it just felt absolutely right no. um, for the first time. Yeah, this is what this needs. I don't know why I'm saying this, it's a digression. But no, it's no. the thing about the gallery. Yeah. And um, I think the, the equivalent of the song uh, would be if you have an instrumental finding the right title for it because yeah. that's all the lyrics you've got is that's that right. title so the steps 
The steps to where? I mean, there's a... There's you know, a... the steps to where and, and from and spectral mornings. Yeah. What's that all about? But it was the idea of the, combination the release of, that of the word, spirit it? after yeah. afterwards. It's afterlife. There's a Beckett play called Breath where, do you yeah. know, I don't know if you know it, there's the, the lights go up on the stage and it's just full of rubbish. Right. And then there's an amplified sigh. Right. And then that's it. That's, that's the it. play. Yeah. But I, I knew people had been... And I was teaching it the other day or teaching Beckett the other day and I was just thinking, well, what if that breath is God's breath of disappointment? On the right. shit of the world, well, and then like, so what else is there indeed. to say? And then it, the context changes, mm. and because the titles in plays are crucial, mm. yes, and that, and I think you can say that the best art forms are all equivalent. Yes. and I think the aim of all drama, the aim of some when I'm writing plays or whatever, is to aspire to yes. a musical level of yeah. perfection because there's something that music does which no one else can. You, you can't do it in another form. You can attempt. Yeah. You can create sad things, or you can create moving scenes or, or images. And yet, when your inner harmonic shifts yeah. at a certain moment, or there's a certain note to a certain sound, you can't uh, equal that in writing. You can find the music in Shakespeare. Yeah. Uh, someone famously said, um, "You're not going to understand Shakespeare the first time you read it in right. through. Just listen to it for its music." So right. I started to read Shakespeare at yeah. one point. Um, never studied it. Yeah. But I wanted to do a Midsummer Night's Dream, and uh, I tried to stay with the play yeah. every day. Once I realised that was what it was going to be a- right. about, and and read it for its music. Right. So there is something about about that the perfection of the musical form, and yet, as you say, what you're doing now seems to equate far more to painting, and therefore has a kind of uh, emotional connection, obviously, with your father. Yes. Um, there was yeah. a great interview with Brian Eno that Stuart McConey did, and he was, yeah. they did a kind of joke about. Um, Brian Eno's father being a postman. Right. And Stuart McConey said, and so in a way, you're, Brian, you're a sort of postman of ideas in terms of delivering these different innovations as he does. Yes. Um, so that sense that we're honouring our fathers in a way, and that yes. we, we become our fathers, and that you and your form are perhaps... Yes, I'm, I'm doing... Would that be fair to say? Yeah, I, I think it would be the, the equivalent. I'm mm. trying to do things in songs that... that um, uh, like when I was a kid, I was always trying to fit things that were too too big into things that were too small. So I'm trying to stretch the idea of what a song is is capable of doing. So, Mm. for instance, I'm writing one about Iceland because uh, Joe had visited Iceland and then I got a chance to visit and work with an Icelandic band to a terrific. And um, um, the landscape was was extraordinary. And, uh, you know, we both had eye problems for a month afterwards (laughs) because the the intensity of the cold was like nothing else. And this landscape is like nothing else, but then it's... The Northern Lights, which we almost managed to see, the Aurora Borealis. Yeah. Um, but nonetheless, having seen it on film, um, all of that informs this thing. And at one point, we were um, very close in this place called Akarera, if I'm Akare, working with an orchestra up there. Um, and we were told it was 50 miles from the North Pole. Right. And um, this place was covered in snow. <laughs> Not surprisingly. Says it on the and, tin. <laughs> yeah. And it was as if this place was always dark and covered in snow. And it, it's odd. And um, I thought, yeah, I've got to write a song called 50 Miles from the North Pole. Right. And then I read, was it yesterday? The guy that died um, trying to do the Antarctic oh, right, um, yeah. to be the, the first man alive or the only man alive to, to have done it right. um, as a solo yeah. journey. And he had given up yeah. literally 30 miles short of his... Yeah. Uh, and he was airlifted out, I believe, uh, but he died in hospital. I'm sorry I haven't got the man's name. No. God rest his soul, but Explorer who died, front page of the Times and all that. And um, um, I thought, yes, 30 miles, you know, 50 miles. There's some, there's some synchronicity going on here. This, this feels... Um, so there's a purity to it. There's a purity yes. to what you're talking about, which is, uh, it's almost like the, the founders... I was going to ask a question about... What you think? I have a view about your generation of people, yeah. that kind of post-war generation, people born after the war in the early fifties, um, yeah. being being kind of 
I, I literally think you can say it ain't like it used to be. It's, yeah. There seems to be something very particular about that generation. Maybe. You talk about the Stones and you know, they're in their 70s. Yes. They yes. create the form. Yeah. Why should they stop just because yeah. they're nearly... Leonard Cohen's right. 83, he's yeah. out there, he's still doing it. Why should yeah, they yeah. stop? What, what is it about? Because I, I get prog every month and... Yes. I only read half of it. I only read yeah. the bits if it's a, if it's you or if it's yes yeah. or if it's the, the yeah. I don't read the new band bits. Yes. Are they advancing the form, the new bands that come? Because it it seems to be that you're the archetypal right. generation within that genre right. of music and you've yes. gone back to what you're saying yeah. now about this new piece. Yes. You're going back to a kind of purity of inspiration yes. and form. Yeah. And yet the new bands seem to be... Are they advancing the form or are they just picking up on certain aspects of I what's think, gone before? I think that in, in, in general they're probably afraid to stick their head above the parapet because I think they came out of a more a controlled era. Um, in the 1980s, uh, the tail was wagging the dog. Um, yes, you had to look glamorous and it seemed as if the music was starting to become secondary to, you know, style over content. Right. Um, so, um, you know, there's a certain price for that. So people have... I'm not going to say music was much better back then because that would be reactionary, and I, I don't believe that was the case. Right. I think that what is it allowed through mm. these days, through the through the grid, through the, the, the Russian judges marking, the, yeah. you know, all the other... <laughs> Um, uh, ice skaters down right. so that they're uh, this tightly controlled thing um, um, I think something's been lost I like to think that the era that I came out of um, and of course I would say this because my when I had my rage of hormones and when I was coming up through um, uh, Roy Orbison who was a fantastic singer by Absolutely. all and he didn't but, uh, yeah, yeah, and 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 earlier than that, Mario Lanza, who was a fantastic singer, and um, but then I could listen to Chuck Berry, you right. know, and say, well, obviously this guy had had limits. He was really a guitar player, but it works for me. Limited and, uh, forms are a means to greater expression. Well, I think I think so. I mean, I, I greatly admired the Stones. Um, I learnt. I learned a lot copying um, early Keith Richard, who learned from Chuck Berry. So it's this thing about it doesn't really matter who who comes up with yeah. with it, is it? It's the fact that you're keeping going, much like that explorer trying to do the thing with the you know the and Antarctic. yet they are not, are they? Those those progen- progenitors yes are in their seventies, yeah, more or less doing the songs or the music that they wrote when they were in their 20s, yes, whereas yeah. your generation that came after them, yes. five, about five, six, seven, ten years after them, are continuing to produce well, new and interesting work and to discover. I liked The Stones at their most progressive. Um, in fact, I was rather disappointed that it um, started to straighten up in a way. Yeah. Um, I liked the more romantic aspects. I liked Paint It Black. I liked yeah. the addition of, of sitar. I yeah. liked... Brian Jones, the extra yeah. colour, all the other instruments. Yeah. Um, I liked Lady Jane, whether or not that's hip now. And you say, well, no, it's Lady Jane's great. Lady it's Jane, a lovely, and yeah. lovely song, and and, and you was, did what a perceptive Jane. lyric as yeah, well. Yeah. You yeah. know about, yeah. you know, so, uh, this kind of medieval, whether it's the courtesan, you know, you, it's someone with an eye to the main child. So I'm sorry, I can't now because you know. Uh, the, uh, all, all of that now. beautiful and, but nothing um, and Ru- Ruby, Ruby Tuesday well yeah you know about the girl who can't be can't be bought right uh, so are you saying then that if you produce things that are as complete as that and as special as that in a way yes. they don't need to produce anything else because they really haven't produced anything of worth since Angie really well it's in my view, but we're not talking about the Stones. Yes, we're not talking no. about the Stones. We're, we're talking about people in general. Yeah, we're talking about generation. Straighten up. I think people straighten up. I think they like to be recognised. I think that if you want to have success, um, uh, yeah, you're lucky if you have one or two hits. Right. Um, uh, a large amount of, of recycling, whereas to reinvent yourself, and yeah. I think that Bowie did this and famously took chances, and so Tin Men I thought was very interesting. Oh, suddenly I'll be a, a singer in a in a heavy metal band, yeah. because I I haven't done that. Yeah. Um, 
And yet he got so and that's not, panned for that. Well, it doesn't really matter, no. does it? You know, one minute it's androgyny, the next yeah. moment he's doing um, Jacques Brel's My Death. Yeah. And um, Anthony uh, Newley. Was, was that? Yeah, well, there you go. Yeah, the great uh, Anthony Newley. <laughs> sorry, you're saying the that... Great, the, great, well, the great Anthony Newley, which was his, his original template, wasn't it? Bowie's template. But I think his, his remarkable thing was how he changed and that... Yes. And how he innovate, he continued to innovate. Yeah. And that last Tear album. Out the rule book. Remarkable. Yeah. Yes. It's a beautiful. I haven't thing. heard it yet. But it's, it's, it's he's basically but he's course, talking about his own death and he's yeah. staging his own death. It's well, stunning. and as I say, you know, he was um, prepared to write songs about death. Mm. I think, um, as I say, Jacques Brel's "My Death," um, uh, and, and it might just appear right at the end of what is it? Cracked actor. Yeah. Um, I used to know. Um, Alan Yentob and then yeah. he became very famous yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wouldn't dare pick up the phone now <laughs> but you would want to nasty um, you know you have that that thing I believe it's at the end of, of the cracked actor um, mm. uh, 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 film about Bowie um, and I don't know if people are aware of that and should go back to that but obviously he was prepared to you know, face that and question that even then, yeah. you know, the thing about being finite. And yeah. uh, and most people will be going, well, oh, we can't do that because it's like it lays itself open to the critic to say, yes, well, not only is it singing about death, this sounds deathly and and they've just sealed their own fate, sealed your own coffin here, mate. Um, but I don't think anything should be off limits. No. Hopefully, you know, there's a thing that I liked and possibly like most about the Beatles was not the bright and cheerful stuff, but Eleanor Rigby. Yeah, yeah. That's the race the to the stuff. grave. Yeah, the dark stuff. Yeah. And um, suddenly songs are about something more poignant. And um, uh, young guys in their 20s writing about an impossibly marginalised character at the end of her days. That, to me, shows... It's remarkable. Depth it? and, 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 and um, that's... You can date the genius to write there, really. That's a real song, and I gather yeah. it was written... Um, it was group written. Yeah. And I was only 16 when it came out, so I was completely open away. to that and completely blown away by it and, and remain so, the fact that there was such pathos. And Is there a conflict for you, then, when, between lyrical concerns and musical ones is that do you feel that within the thought because you're driven by this eclecticism and this yeah. need to cover many different styles that when you're writing a piece I mean I'm thinking of something a, a song which really affected me which was The Hermit which I think the is Hermit. often overlooked right. um, and really which I yeah. think is one of the more, your most beautiful pieces and obviously the only song you sing on Voyage of the Acolyte yeah. you've not really done a song like no, that no I probably since. wouldn't do anything um, uh, and that's very much about sort of death and well, perhaps it is, you know, I haven't yeah, really looked at, 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 okay, at the basically. lyrics then. But you see, um, at the time, I was thinking of the way Donovan sounded. Right. And, I, and I listened to a lot of Donovan stuff. And I thought, well, I could sound a bit like this if I used sort of heavy, oh, like heavy, heavy vibrato. Yeah. And it's a bit Alan Adele, isn't it? It's right. a bit <laughs> sort of, you know, it's, 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 it's very floppy clothes. It's, well, it's very a very song for a 24-year-old man to have written. Yeah, maybe that's it. I don't because know. Because it, it's almost like it predicts your whole... In its simplicity, yeah. it, it, to me, maybe it always it prefigures a lot of your style and all of your atmosphere. Yeah. I mean, obviously, people we talk about Ace of Wands and yeah. the, st the stunning mix in that. And, oh, I'm glad you like it. I'm, I'm glad you like a, any of it. It's a beautiful... <laughs> I mean, I was going to ask about the box set, what the, the recent box set of the Charisma Years. What, what was the intention of it? Was that, was that to say, here were the... This is the legitimate first significant chunk of the career that is that what, what, what brought that box as a is that about sort of showcasing that career and then saying that what because of what you're doing now is all what, one um, piece it was driven by mark powell right um and at the time emi had the rights to that okay universal inherited the the, the emi catalog all right and luckily all although right. we hadn't managed to get the idea away with um, um, EMI, um, Universal, mm. many of the same people, seemed to like the idea. No. So um, it wasn't something that was prompted by me, but I was delighted that we managed to get it okay. uh, that it's far. A commercial thing, an artistic... 
Uh, well, it was a commercial thing driven by other people because right. I didn't think that, um, you know, that that idea would be a goer. Right. Um, but, but it's happened and it's bloody well sold out everywhere. In terms of the music business today, yeah, how do you, how does one negotiate one's way through it? Well, it's a little bit like I, I met um, John Mayle. Well, I used to go, it. I used to go and see John Mayle when I was sixteen at Eel Pie Island and saw him around various gigs, and um, in those days he might be standing there, but I, I was very shy. I didn't say, "Oh, we'd like your stuff, Mister Mayle." Uh, but. We were at a, at a classic thingy awards uh, a while back, and I thought, I'm going to go and say hi. This guy said, I used to go and see you when I was 16. He said, probably the same thing that he says to everyone. He said, I'm going to be doing a gig next next week. I, I'm going to be 80. Now, that, in a way, says it all. Mm. Segovia still gigging at 93, died at 94, as far as I know, if I got the timeline right there. Uh, much the same thing. Did never met him, but I met Les Paul, right. who died at ninety four. And um, I thought, you know, these guys are troopers. Mm. You know, um, how old was BB King when he died? But you know, Nearly he, he kept going, yeah. and you know, the, the last days were last gigs were in, from a wheelchair. Yeah. Hoagie Carmichael, he was one hundred and one. Well, there you go. This is good. Now I had an uncle who lived till he was one hundred and eight. So I'm hoping wow. <laughs> to uh, still be doing it right. and to be 108 and um, and uh, if there's still an audience for a 108 year old guitarist who is probably going to go on dribbling, um, you know, as long as I can make a, a noise for a living, uh, as long as I can still make a noise. Right. Well, really like your stuff, Mr. Hackett, so we'll do our, we'll do our best to <laughs> yeah. make sure they come along. Yeah. The Denby Hall home for retired rock musicians. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, that's probably where it'll be, won't it? Yeah. yeah.